Back on Big Ten today, our big stat focusing on volleyball. Minnesota returning the reigning Big Ten Player of the Year in Taylor Landfair. Gophers have dominated this award of late. Four of the last five winners playing for the Maroon and Gold. Landfair, of course, with a new coach this year. He is today's big interview. The man in charge of the Gophers, Keegan Cook. He joins us now from Minneapolis. Coach, I want to start with this. You had a great job. You were at a program in Washington that you had taken to the Final Four, a program that's nationally ranked every year, one that's going to be joining the Big Ten this season from now, although you didn't know that at the time. What, what was so appealing about Minnesota that you decided to leave what was a great situation in Seattle? Yeah, like you said, di didn't see it coming. Uh, I think that happens a lot in life. Uh, it, what struck me was just the responsibility uh, of the opportunity uh, following two coaches, Hugh McCutcheon especially, uh, but Mike Hebert as well. Just uh, a program that has meant so much to the sport of volleyball and, and had such continued success. I thought, they got to get this right. And, and the more I thought about it, I thought, well, who, who's going to take that job? And unfortunately, as I reflected, I realized, uh oh, it might be me. It might be my time to, to take that responsibility. Well, you mentioned Hugh McCutcheon, who did an amazing job. I thought one parallel that was really interesting for me was you had a similar situation when you took over at Washington. Like a lot of people take over a program because the previous coach was unsuccessful or was fired. Clearly not the case either place. Jim McLaughlin did an amazing job at Washington. Now you're succeeding Hugh McCutcheon at Minnesota. Help me understand the, the similarities there, and maybe if you have some sort of a blueprint that clearly worked at Washington for situations like this. Yeah, strange niche to occupy here. <laughs> Not one I would <laughs> recommend for everyone, but uh, one I'm certainly grateful for. Uh, I think the biggest thing I've thought about is just seeking to understand before being understood is just a principle that I think helps a lot in transitions. Asking a lot of questions from a place of curiosity, not from judgment. Making sure that you're making intentional changes, that you're being selective about what you install too early. And then also just involving the players. I think that helps in a really uncertain time for them to give them some autonomy in how they want to move forward. In what ways have you given them autonomy? Yeah, besides, I don't know, they pick most of my recruiting outfits these days. They said I needed some help there. But I don't know, just <laughs> some, some nominal choices, practice times, meal times. Um, just trying to get feedback quite a bit from them about how things are going, being flexible. Um, I think those are, those are, I don't know, best practices that I would advise to anybody who's making a transition from one I, program to another, particularly one that's had success. I need to know more about the outfits. I mean, what, what was the change that you instituted? Yeah, T Taylor Lanfair let me know that my shoes were, were pretty subpar, so she's, <laughs> uh, she's been sending me pictures, and her and my wife are working together to get things at a championship standard. You mentioned Taylor Lanfair, and we said coming off the top there, she's the reigning Big Ten player of the year and so I would think that your first task or very early on on your list of tasks was convincing her to stay. What was your pitch? How did you keep Taylor Landfair in Minneapolis? She, she had a passion for Minnesota. You know, she, she made that pretty public early on and uh, I think my, my strategy was I flew to her home. Uh, I met her family and, and shared with them uh, my coaching philosophy and values and, and shared some of the vision for, for the players that we were looking to add to the program in the near future and, and, and was tried to be sincere and accurate to who I am. And, and as the spring has gone on and we moved into the summer, just the conversations have been even better and better. Coaching her ha has gotten more and more fun and productive. And, and so, yeah, w what a great leader she is becoming and, and was during that transition. So you get the player of the year back. You also get the defensive player of the year in the conference to transfer over. And Kylie Murr, who was at Ohio State, strange situation there with the scholarship. She's available in the portal. What was the, the sell there and how important might that have been? As you were, you were mentioning, kind of talking to Taylor about well, who's out there and who might we add. Was there kind of a symbiosis there? Yeah, it was a must-get player the first week on the job is what I would say. Uh, as a staff, it was her official visit was was our first week, and 
we thought we need to send a message that that this is programs in a great place and that we're moving forward and uh, and Kylie's uh, addition was a big part of that and I think once we started there and, and she decided to join us uh, then it was uh, we started making progress pretty quickly but uh, thrilled to have her great relationship with Melanie Shaftmaster tremendous leader already and someone that I've just loved coaching here in the early days one thing that really interests me is that Coach McCutcheon is still involved in the program. He's an assistant athletic director. Help me understand that relationship and to what extent you have been working with him versus for him or, or versus just kind of doing your own thing. Yeah, you know, I think his, his quote to me was, come find me in my office. I'm not going to walk into yours, but I'm here for you at any moment. And he certainly have, has lived that from day one. Probably see him on a monthly basis and, and ask him some questions that maybe he would only have the answers to, whether that be institutional knowledge or, or just coaching in general. It's a role that I think more universities should be adding. I had it at Washington with Chris Peterson. Um, and just that mentorship uh, from someone who's been in it, I think you'd see a lot more success from, from young coaches and coaches in transition if, if universities were as forward thinking as Minnesota with that position. I want to get a little bit into your background because I just think it's a really interesting one. You're from California. You fell in love with volleyball watching your sister play the sport. Like, explain kind of what it was that, that grabbed you about volleyball. Yeah, younger siblings get dragged to tournaments, you know, and I think every <laughs> younger sibling thinks they're better than their older sibling, which I certainly thought. And I wasn't. She was a Division One player, and, and my place in the game was quickly on the sideline as opposed to on the court as an elite athlete. But, uh, you know, she was a large influence for me. She was my first boss, got me my first coaching job. Uh, I worked for her for 10 years, you know, at a club. I'd, I'd work all day at St. Mary's College. I'd work all night at her volleyball club. And, and I was getting incredible experience uh, uh, head coaching. Um, I, I didn't even know it. I was fortunate uh, to, to be gaining experience that I wish more coaches uh, had uh, these days. You were talking about your time at St. Mary's. It started when you were an undergraduate. Explain your role as what it seemed like was kind of a, a student manager slash coach slash analytics guy. I mean, what, what was the what was the role there? Yeah. Yeah, I was a math major, although I would claim to be more of an arithmetic major, according to my professors. <laughs> but, you know, I joined the program with, with a really uh, established head coach, uh, Rob Brownian, who came from the USA Olympic team. And he handed me an early version of an analytics program that's now industry standard. He said, here you go, figure it out. And, and that was where I, I started to have an eye for the game and, and watching film and, and doing all the things that um, you know we have full-time positions for now. I didn't know it at the time, but what a gift it was to to see the game through that lens uh, as a young as a young coach. Interesting to me that you have a bath background in math or as you say in arithmetic, but either way, analytics are such a huge part of sports now. I, mean, I think it's been one of the sea changes here over the last. 15 20 years how big a role do analytics still play in your coaching in your programs yeah i think it's twofold one i think it helps coaches to understand what they're seeing and to make objective decisions and to track growth athletes are really excited when they can see improvement it's hard to see improvement at this level. The, the, the gains are incremental. And I think analytics and film give us uh, a little insight into that to show them. Uh, I think the hard part is just, can you tell a story from the information? And, and I think coaches have more information than they need now more than ever. But, but can, you, can you translate it to the team? Can you, can you tell a story that will actually uh, influence them in a meaningful way? And I th I'd like to think that that's been something that I've been good at in my time as a head coach. We had a lot of success, obviously, in Washington. I think it's really interesting that you're coming from Washington. Obviously, Washington is going to be coming into the Big Ten, along with Oregon and USC and UCLA. So you're going to have familiarity with this expanded portion of the Big Ten. I was talking about this yesterday with Kelly Sheffield, but for people maybe who don't follow West Coast Volleyball as closely, give them a sense for what the Big Ten is getting here volleyball-wise. Yeah, four of the top volleyball programs. You know, if you had asked us to, to pick which universities to join the Big Ten, 
those four would have been right at the top of the list. And so you took two, four storied powerhouse programs with national championship experience and bring them into a league that was already uh, leading the country. And uh, yeah, you create a lot of excitement for fans and athletes and, and a lot of anxiety for coaches, I think is what we just <laughs> accomplished in a very short period of time. Coach, I wanna leave you with this. You might have a little anxiety when you look at the schedule coming up here. You guys have TCU and Baylor, of course, this week. The Big Ten, Big 12 Challenge could be here on the Big Ten Network. You have Texas next week, number one team in the country, also on the Big Ten Network. I was looking through you have five straight, I think, top 15 games uh, on your schedule. What do you hope to learn about your team here early on? Yeah, what does it take to win a national championship? I mean, uh, that's... That's what you want to know at the end of this non-conference. You'll certainly see some national contenders in conference, but you don't want to show up in December and be surprised. And and that was the mindset around the preseason schedule. Uh, learn fast and, and be ready to go once Big Ten play rolls around. So a little self-induced uh, anxiety there, but uh, just I'm, I'm thrilled for our players and our fans to, to see what this team can do against the quality opponents we've set up. We've had a lot of anxiety conversations here in the last <laughs> minute or so. So, Coach, I'll let you simmer down. I won't ask you anything else to make you anxious. But really, really appreciate you coming on. Welcome to the Big Ten. Really great to have you. Keegan Cook, very much appreciate your time. Dave, thanks so much for this. Appreciate it.